we want to welcome everyone back to part three of our teaching on Mystery Babylon. You're in for a treat today as Walid and Ted Shubat have um, been working, studying um, on this topic, and we're going to jump right into the content today. And Ted, we're going to hand it over to you. Why don't you update us on current events in the middle of this COVID-19 pandemic, things you're seeing um, unfold these last uh, seven days? Well, the coronavirus crisis, or the corona crisis as I call it, has started a global um, economic crisis, an economic depression, because uh, people haven't been working. And so with that, people aren't paying their rent and people aren't paying their loans. And so what you end up with is an implosion of an economic crisis, something far worse than what the world saw in 2008 and 2009, and also something worse than what the world endured in the 1920s, uh, Great Depression. And so as the 1920s and 1930s Great Depression eventually sparked um, a surge in popularity for fascism and also in uh, communistic ideas in the 20th century, in the, in the times and in the days of our great grandparents, I think that this global uh, economic crisis that we are heading towards is also going to spark a global, um, a global radicalism, a global surge in radical ideologies, far left socialism and also um, ultranationalism. Uh, and within that, we are going to be seeing fascism becoming more and more favorable amongst people. And we are also going to be seeing uh, friction within the European Union. Uh, last week, I wrote an article about Germany attacking the European Central Bank. And this is pretty significant because what has been keeping Europe united all these years is the Euro, the Eurozone. And the Eurozone is the only thing keeping Europeans united. Because you have countries, deficit countries, like Italy and Greece, that have benefited greatly from the Eurozone. They have benefited from the European Central Bank financially assisting them. And if you don't have that European Central Bank, then there's no point in really staying unified. In fact, what you have is antagonism. So the Italians, they have been the most devastated by the corona crisis. They had the highest amount of deaths. And they haven't really recovered from the economic crisis that hit Europe in 2009. And so what the Italians have been asking for and what they have been getting from the European Central Bank is simply for the, uh, the European Central Bank to buy Italy's debt in exchange for, for interest. So the European Central Bank would buy Italy's debt and then Italy would pay back the central bank, the European Central Bank, by giving, uh, by giving them interest. And that would slowly accumulate into paying them, paying them back, paying that loan back. And the German uh, government, the highest court in Germany, which I believe is called the German Constitutional Court, said that what the European Central Bank is doing is unconstitutional and against uh, EU law. And so, for the Germans to attack the European Central Bank is quite, I don't want to say unprecedented, but it's very, very serious because it's attacking the only entity that's keeping Europe united. And if the European Central Bank stops helping the countries that are in debt and that are uh, deficit, that are uh, insolvable, um, these countries aren't going to really see any necessity to being under the Eurozone. And so we could be seeing the beginning of a major fragmentation of the European uh, Union. We saw this with Brexit, that was the beginning, but we could be seeing this um, have a ripple effect in tor towards more fragmentation. And remember what happened after, after the First World War, the United States tried to unite the world under the gold standard. That was the dollar zone, essentially. The dollar became the most powerful currency. Eventually, what happened was the Germans and the Japanese re rebelled against the gold standard. They left the gold standard. And after the Second World War, the United States attempted to do essentially the same thing through the Bretton Woods Agreement, 
under which the world would be under the gold standard. And we are no longer under the gold standard and the Europeans have their own, have their own currency zone called the Eurozone. And what we could be seeing is the Germans really rebelling against the Eurozone and trying to bring back the Deutschmark. And I can say right now that if the Deutschmark comes back, count the wheats uh, for, another, for another conflict in Europe. That's what I would say. Hey, to give a def definition for fascism for people. Well, fascism uh, generally is, is a term used to describe tyranny and despotism. So if something is tyrannical, people will say, oh, well, that's fascist. And that's become part of, the, part of the modern day vernacular. You know, you call anything that is despotic or something that is perceived as despotic as fascist. But the actual definition of fascism is really the merging between the state and corporations. That's what fascism is. It's the merging between the state and the corporations. Essentially, the, the corporate world becomes the government. And we saw this in the Third Reich, in which giant corporations like um, IG Farben were literally running work and death camps. They were running labor camps. And in Japan, Mitsubishi, you know, when we think of Mitsubishi, we think of cars and all that. But during the Second World War, Mitsubishi was running labor camps. And people were actually buried alive in one particular camp. Um, during the end of the war, the, the war um, a group of American POWs alongside, I think, some French and Dutch people and uh, some other um, allied uh, soldiers were actually forced into uh, a giant tunnel under the ground and they demolished the, the only exit out. And those people were buried alive. And that was done in a Mitsubishi labor camp. Um, and also you see like, uh, you'll, you'll read about like high ranking directors of the Deutsche Bank that were huge Nazis and they had like tremendous amounts of political leverage within the government. So fascism is when corporations take control over law and they have tremendous amounts of, of government power. Um, and we can say that right now, the Western world isn't too far away from becoming fascist. That was my next question of where do we see early stages of fascism rising in the West and America? during um, this pandemic? Well, what I would say to that is, you know, it's, it's quite scary because we talk about the Holocaust and we talk about Nazism and we say never again, but people today, the masses today are actually very susceptible to accepting fascism. Mm -hmm. So for example, when we hear about people being locked, and I, and I know this is a very sensitive topic for conservatives, but when we hear about people being locked up in cages because they're migrants and they're being forced into these like very terrible conditions, very terrible hygiene conditions, and they're not even allowed to have toothbrushes in certain uh, uh, migrant camps in the United States, and you hear conservatives saying, well, it's not a big deal, who cares, oh well. Um, that to me is a sign that we, if, if we can make someone an enemy, if we can make a certain group of people an enemy, for example, in this case, it would be the illegal immigrant, and we can see that person suffer and say, oh, well, who cares? We're, we are actually very susceptible to becoming a society that could look at people suffering in work camps and think nothing of it because, well, those people are perceived as enemies. And that's what's so scary. Um, you know, we talk about how you know, we, we'll ask a question, we'll say, how come the German people just accepted the Third Reich and didn't think anything of it? Because in their minds, in the, in the collective mind of Germany in those days, they really believed that the Third Reich was fighting communism. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when they were slaughtering the Poles by the millions, they really believed that the Poles were the enemy of Germany or one of the big enemies of Germany. So if we can simply concoct an image of someone as an enemy or a group of people as an enemy, and we can watch those people suffer and think nothing of it, then we are always susceptible uh, to, to turning to fascism. And we'll bring Wally in here on the conversation. And I wanna finish with uh, one final current event, uh, Ted, that you released on the blog today. Um, but it, the headline was that um, 2020 is now the new 2007. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. Andrew Biazad had authored that. Yeah. Brought that out. Well, 
Talk a little bit about that with yes. Some well, because, workforce now having this market to have to go and work in, and it's showing signs of what was it what it was like in two thousand seven. Yeah, well, it's it's simple. I mean, oh seven was the beginning of the economic crisis, the Great Recession that we that we that the United States and Europe had to suffer through, and so in twenty twenty we are going to be going through something much worse. Um, if you look at the amount of debt that is in a country like Italy. The amount of debt that Italy has now is greater than the amount of debt that Greece had during its economic crisis in 2009 and 2010. So it, the OA economic crisis caused a political ripple effect. It made people like Bernie Sanders very popular. It made ideas like socialism become not, not extremely popular, but something uh, that could be accepted within uh, normal conversation almost. Yeah. Um, it began the steps of that, like for example, with um, with Occupy Wall Street, um, anti corporation sentiment, basically populism. Mm -hmm. uh, populism became popular as a result of the 08 uh, uh, crisis, and then in 2010, when Europe was going through its economic crisis, things like that ultra nationalism, Catalonian separatism, they didn't become extremely popular, but they began to manifest with substantial followings in 2010, 2009. So because we're about to go through something far worse than 07, 09, 2010, the political ripple effect is going to be something much, much more scary. On top of that, we have a migrant crisis. We have a food, a huge food shortage that is going on in East Africa, especially in Kenya. This is going to trigger a migrant crisis into Europe. With the migrant crisis of 2015, nationalism became extremely popular with parties that would otherwise be considered fringe getting substantial votes and seats in parliaments, in various European parliaments. And that was because of the migrant crisis. Imagine what would happen if you have a migrant crisis on top of a economic crisis, far worse than what, the, what Europe went through in the 1920s. Yeah. P the amount of political radicalism is going to be terrifying. Yeah. Well, like, let's bring you in on the conversation. Let's, when we ended, <clears throat> like, we were talking about Mystery Babylon and how God really doesn't like city life. Why don't you go on and expand into that about uh, okay. getting out of the cities? Well, let's keep in mind, first of all, one of the first commandments. We think of the Ten Commandments, but we keep forgetting that there's commandments before the Ten Commandments. Right in Genesis, yeah. God says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Mm -hmm. God's idea was that humankind expands plenty of land, therefore expand, fill the earth, farm, and, and, and survive that way. God never had the idea of city life, you know, where you sardine a bunch of people in one spot, because city life brings more sin. Yes. City life brings more disease. City life brings a lot of things, you know, that are not good for a human, uh, where everything has to be delivered to the city, you know, where in country life it tends to be farmers you know they tend to be in a better situation to survive catastrophes you know uh, you have a domino effect once something goes on like COVID-19 with city life you know how do you transport beef to major cities how do you transport eggs you know when COVID-19 hit people start running to, to get toilet paper but then later on, you couldn't get find eggs. You couldn't find. I still can't find yeast yeah, no. to big bread. You know, so it becomes very disruptive. And so God's idea was never to have a city life. And how often do you hear pastors talking about, you know, why God doesn't like city life? You know, the issue of city. Uh, then when we go to let's say several parts of the Bible where it talks about city life. Uh, right there in Isaiah 14, for example, it talks about the Antichrist. Remember the five eyes, you know, most Western Christians understand the five eyes is a pride-filled Lucifer here. It says, I will, I will, I will. 
but then they don't scrutinize the rest of the chapter in which in verse 17 for example it says prepare slaughter for his children who is this that's basically the antichrist in this case what we call the antichrist this figure of evil prepare slaughter for his children because of the iniquity of their fathers lest they rise up and possess the land and fill the face of the world with cities how come we don't focus on these verses where god says we should destroy this system because this system the system of the antichrist fills the world with cities wow god doesn't want cities yeah yeah so what does covid 19 do basically cripple cities mm -hmm. yeah of course church closers and I hear many pastors and priests complaining about church can't operate. But is it possible that God is sick of the sermons in these churches? Is it possible he's sick of what they're teaching in these churches? Is it possible he's sick of the homosexual agenda among priests in these churches? And the pedophilia and all these things that happens, you know. There's references in the scripture where God got sick of the temple, God got sick of the sacrificial system of Israel. Yeah. And what did he say? You know, he says, your, your, your burnt offering are, you know, abomination to my nostrils. He doesn't even want to, he says, burnt offering I do not desire. He desires what? Justice. You know? And so justice and truth, you know, if you bring any controversial issue in churches today, you know, whether it's a homosexual agenda, you can talk about that. You could take a verse, you know, husband, you know, wives, obey your husbands as to the Lord. Yeah. And there'll be all kinds of hoopla, you know. Women will object, this and this and that. That's not what it means. That's not what it says, you know. Hey, if there's a decision needs to be made on buying a house or using the credit card, and the husband says, honey, no, it's not a good time. He's the leader. No, is not. You know, you can't tell a woman these days that. You know, yeah. it's husbands obey your wives. Uh, in fact, even in several parts of the Bible, where God opens the court, He says that wives are not obeying their husbands. He's talking about the end of the world here. You know, we can go through many references. These in these days today, much of the controversial issues can't be discussed in churches. You know. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, where the term worthy of death it doesn't mean go kill the gays, but God says he's going to unleash plagues on the earth. Yes. But he's talking about a homosexual agenda. Mm -hmm. But what pastors talk about homosexual agenda these days? But there's many references in the scripture about the cities. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're there in Isaiah 14, very clear picture that God wants to eliminate cities. And in fact, I have several references. In the writings of last year, yeah, last Sunday, the Sunday yes. specials from last year, yes, yeah. Was well, I told folks you need to get out of the city? Yes, you, you know, the, the the message that I gave was simple: that that as soon as you see the world turning into Sodom mm -hmm. or supporting Sodom, it's not it's not really the issue that homosexuals exist. Right. Homosexuals existed throughout history. There's always been homosexual issues. Mm -hmm. It's the issue of the Christian world supporting a homosexual agenda or not really exposing the homosexual agenda. Yes. And God in Ezekiel 17, in Isaiah chapter 3, it's pretty clear. Mm -hmm. Even in Romans chapter 1, where he talks about the wrath to come. Yes. What's that about? What's Paul talking about, the wrath to come? Mm -hmm. Men laying with men, women with women. What's he talking about? What wrath? There has never been a wrath. Right. Uh, and now we're beginning to see, come out of her, my people, this mystery of Babylon, lest you suffer in her plagues. Yes. In fact, you know, when we talk about Christ's coming, you know, in Matthew 24, many know Matthew 24. Yes. yes. You know, so when we see COVID-19, here we all run and say, you know, hey, Jesus is going to be coming soon. This is the end of the world. And we shouldn't do that. We should be more careful. Because 
we had the Spanish flu in 1918. Jesus talks about co plagues coming to the earth. And maybe we should read a few verses from Matthew 24. Yes. Where he gives you the criteria of his coming. Mm -hmm. You know, first thing he says, don't be deceived. Deception will, will run amok. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then he says, many will come in my name mm -hmm. and deceive. Okay, well, how does somebody come in Christ's name? Well, what he's warning about is really Christendom turning apostate. Many will come in my name and deceive, say, I'm the Christ. He's not warning about them liberals. He's warning about wolves in sheep's clothing. Yes, yes. He's not warning about wolves. Mm -hmm. He's warning about wolves in sheep's clothing. Because <laughs> you can tell a wolf, but in sheep's clothing, you can't tell. Yeah. So he's warning about that masquerading faces of claiming to be part of the Christian world. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And so he gives us the criteria about his coming. And he says in verse 7, For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences. Mm -hmm. COVID-19 is a pestilence. Yes. And earthquakes in various places. Mm -hmm. So it's the combination of all these. Yes. Yeah. That's why when they came up with this blood moon idea, so, you know, the moon turning blood, you know, that's ridiculous because there's other verses that says, hey, the sun will grow dark. Mm -hmm. So you have to have the combination, the whole thing coming together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We see COVID-19, but we don't see earthquakes, you know. Yeah. Uh, we could see maybe the San Andreas fold. Hey, that's an alarming thing. Mm -hmm. But it's got to be all over the globe, the increase of earthquakes. Some assume that there's an increase of earthquake. Yeah. I don't yeah. agree. Because, you know, the magnitude of the earthquakes. Like you're saying that when you see something like, you know, COVID-19 being a pestilence, to really grab the attention of Bible prophecy, it, it usually is a global occurrence when it takes place. Yes, yes. Pandemics could be a punishment. You know, God is upset, you know. And it's not unlikely because he does talk about Mystery Babylon having plagues. Yeah. And, you know, let's not... You know, underestimate COVID-19. COVID-19 crippled the whole earth. Right, yeah, it did. When was the last time we've seen the whole earth crippled? Yeah. For several weeks here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And could go on till 2020, you know. Uh, so we have to have the combination of these things. We have to have the earthquakes, the famines, and the pestilence. Now, people talk about there's some possible food shortages. Talk about maybe the issue of uh, Africa having locusts. But that's not enough evidence to say that, you know, he's knocking at the door, he's coming. You know, that the Messiah is coming, you know. It's still going to be some time, I believe. Mm -hmm. However, we're beginning to, be, to see the beginning of sorrow. These are the beginning of sorrows. So yeah. we haven't seen nothing yet. No. Okay. Uh, several parts... In, in my writings. In fact, I have a, a I wrote a, basically a book called Generation Solemn. I haven't published it. And then I began to take excerpts from Generation Solemn and posting it on my website last year, telling folks, get out of the city. Mm -hmm. You know, had many heeded that advice, they'd be much better off doing this COVID-19 issue. Yes. Okay, in, in Isaiah 52, 11, God warns. He says about Mystery Babylon, depart, depart, go, go out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Go out from the midst of her. Be clean, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So what God is requiring is a cleansing of the church, a cleansing of the church itself. We're not talking about just the congregants, but the church authority itself. Mm -hmm. And an abomination is going on in the church itself. So he's really addressing the church as becoming sort of mystery Babylon. Yes. And then in Revelation 16, 18, look what it says. And there were noises and thunder and lightning, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake that had not occurred since the men were on earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. 
Why is it talking about all the cities of all nations falling? As part of this whole episode of the destruction of Mystery Babylon. So Mystery Babylon constitutes the cities of the earth. Yes. The mother being Jerusalem. Christendom itself is part of this mystery Babylon, not just Islam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then in Isaiah 14, who destroys these cities? It's the system of the Antichrist itself mm -hmm. yeah. destroys the harlot, yes. which are really the cities of the earth. When it addresses the Antichrist in Isaiah 14, verses 16 to 17, this is the man. That's not Lucifer and his angelic as an angelic being. Mm -hmm. It's no longer this is the angel, the cherub in the garden of God. Yes. This is the cherub in the garden of God manifesting himself as this man of sin. Yeah. This is the man that troubled the earth, that made kings to shake, that made the whole earth desolate and destroyed its cities. So God allows this antichrist system yes. to destroy itself. It's self-destructive. Yeah, yes. And everything works together for good. Even the works of the antichrist ends up for good. Yes. Yeah. As when the crowd said, crucify him, crucify him. That's that was our salvation. Yeah. You see? And so to destroy Christ, was the victory yes. yes to destroy christendom christianity still a victory don't worry mm -hmm. even when it comes to the state of israel most people think that israel will be unscathed it's from micah 5. micah 5 is such a crucial prophecy it's talking about the birth of christ in bethlehem the coming of the messiah mm -hmm sprouting from Bethlehem Ifrata in Israel. And then he talks about the coming of the Messiah, coming of Christ again. Yes. In those references, I, 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 and I'm just reading from what I wrote, God rescues only a remnant. God destroys Israel's chariots and destroys all of Israel's fat cities. All of them. Mm -hmm. God tells Israel the following, quote, I will destroy your chariots, cut off the cities of your land, and throw down all your strongholds. Mm -hmm. In other words, Israel will be so desperate. That's how Christ rescues it in the end, when only a remnant remains. Mm -hmm. So I wrote, Tel Aviv gone, Israel's Demona and Sorek nuclear facilities, gone. All of the strongholds, gone. Iran's mullahs already threatened to strike Dimona and Israel went on red alert 30 times as anxiety grew from the situation in Damascus, Syria. So it's not unlikely. And this is in the Bible itself. How often do you hear these so-called prophecy experts discuss Micah 5, the second coming of Christ? In verse 3, how do we reach this conclusion? Therefore, will he give them, Israel, mm -hmm. up? He gives them up. Until the time that she, which travails, has brought forth, then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. I thought, Christ was Israeli, okay? How is the remnant of his brethren return to the children of Israel? How could Israelis return to the children of Israel? Because here, it's speaking about the Israel of God. Yes. Okay? Paul, very clearly in the New Testament, says this is the Israel of God, the church. Yes. We keep forgetting that equation. We say Israel is literally Israel all the time in the scripture. That's not true. And I wrote, Micah 5 says, therefore he will give them up and only the remnant of his brethren are saved when they return, repent, and join the children of Israel, that is the church. 
give them up to what? Paul in Romans 1 tells you why he gave, gives Christendom up. Paul in chapter 1 is talking about Christendom. Quote, Therefore God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. Yes. They're teaching lies instead of truth from the scripture. Yes. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. So the dishonorable passions is a result of what? A faulty teaching. Yes. yes. We don't want to say worthy of death, you know. Mm -hmm. Romans 1 continues with men laying with men. Exactly what you see Israel today supporting. God is not mocked, and you ought to stop mocking him with your poor interpretations. They supported sodomy, guilty. You think God is going to simply save rainbow flag wavers just because they are the sons of Jacob? God can convert and make the Muslims the sons of Jacob. And he will convert the Muslims to Christianity. And that's also in the scripture, which takes a whole study. Yeah. Yes. In Isaiah 48, he even says to Israel, listen to this, you descendants of Jacob. Who are those? Israel, literal Israel. Mm -hmm. You who are called by my name of Israel, you sons of Jacob, you call yourselves Israel. Yeah. Listen to me, he said. And he says very clearly, and come from the land of Judah. So he know he's specifically speaking of the Jewish people. Yes. You who take oaths in the name of the Lord and invoke the God of Israel, but not in truth or righteousness. You who call yourselves citizens of the holy city and claim to rely on the God of Israel. You have neither heard nor understood, he says in 48. For my own name's sake, I delay my wrath. For the sake of my praise, I hold it back from you so as not to destroy you completely. So he's saying he rejects that. And he delays the wrath, but the wrath will come. No question about it. In fact, even in Isaiah 17, the, the destruction of Damascus. God elevates the refugees of Syria. Yes. And he says Israel will be basically disappointed. Yes. So many have this in reverse. So now we go back to Micah 5. Yes. I will pluck out the Ashiras out of your midst. Micah 5 is not an ancient prophecy, but an ancient event. Micah 5 is about the coming of the Messiah. Yes. So will I destroy your cities? This is a rule. God is not mocked. God is upset about the spread of neo-paganism amongst the secular and the Kabbalah infests Judaism's entire religious sector. Kabbalah is paganism. Mm -hmm. I will wreak vengeance, God says, in anger and wrath upon the nations that have not listened. Isaiah 5, uh, sorry, Micah 5.14. This includes all of fallen Christendom. What was meant to be the Israel of God. Zephaniah confirms. Quote, Zephaniah 1 verse 4, I will stretch my hand against Judah and against all who live in Jerusalem. I will destroy every remnant of Baal worship in this place, the very names of idolatrous priests. Is in Jerusalem already in Judah? This is an allegoric Jerusalem, by the way, as well. So we are supposed to be the Jerusalem too. So it's not only on Israel, it's also on Christendom as a whole. Mm -hmm. 
In fact, God warns, Isaiah 10, verse 16. How often do people refer to this verse? Listen to this verse. The Lord of hosts send among his fat ones leanness. The wealthy nations is going to be reversed to become poor. And under his glory he shall kindle a burning like the burning of fire. Isaiah 10 verse 16. Zephaniah 1.11 Whale who live in the market district. Wall Street. All you merchants will be wiped out. All you who trade with silver will be destroyed. Zephaniah 1.11 Oh, buy gold, buy silver. Oh, yeah, all this. Yeah. Ain't gonna work. Yeah. Okay. There's more. Damascus will cease from being a city. Even Damascus, the city is destroyed. And it will be a ruinous heap. Isaiah 17, verse 4. The fortress also will cease from Ephraim. So the you got all these evangelicals crying out, hey, hey, hey is it, when there's a Syrian war, is this a destruction of Damascus? I said, not yet. Hold your horses. Right. But what about this reference? And the remnant of Syria. They will be as the glory of the children of Israel. Damascus is destroyed, sure, God says. But the survivors of Syria, the Muslims of Syria, will be as the glory of the children of Israel. My gosh. You see, whoa, 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 that's the children of Israel, that's the Jewish people. But excuse me, the fortress also will cease from Ephraim. That's northern Israel. So we have to understand, God is speaking in balance here. He will replace, he always does. He will replace whoever has been fallen away with new recruits. What do you say in that, Wally? Why don't you, you speak to this replacement theology where a lot of evangelicals are taught, oh, you can't have replacement theology. Can you speak to that and explain that? Well, that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you want to talk about replacement theology, I should probably read. from what I've written. Replacement theology, which you define as this, this is how they define it, that the Church of Rome reinterpreted scripture by switching Israel with the church. Where the church transferred all the blessings that God gave to the Jewish people to themselves. While the Jewish people gets to keep all the curses. That's how they look at what they call replacement theology. But I can easily dispel this argument by asking a Jesus-style question. Point the verses regarding the church in the Old Testament. Why is the church been replaced in the Old Testament? By the so-called people who talk about replacement theology, replacement theology. Did God forget to mention the church in the Old Testament? The church from time immemorial taught both in the Hebrew and the church are both addressed in the Old Testament. Why are they, why is the church replaced? There are, there is, now you need to pause, you need to search for some things. Okay, that's yeah. fine. Yeah, because this is a big confusion that I hear. I've even heard pastors talk of, talk against replace, replacement theology. They're just so dead set on literal Israel. Yeah. And that you've heard all the, the cases for it. And now they want to separate all the saints in the Old Testament and the from the church, it doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. Uh, I need to search in my...
And that's why people aren't getting what you're saying, Ted, fully because of all the evangelicals that's telling you just Israel is the prophetic time clock all the yeah. time. You see what's rising in the Western Hemisphere. You know. One thing that I would say about replacement theology is the people who accuse others of replacement theology are actually committing replacement theology themselves because they're replacing the church and they're making Israel or the ethnic Jews of today replace the church of today. They're engaging in replacement theology. That's what I would say. Okay. I found the verses I'm, I'm looking for. Yes, exactly the point. The point is, is that these advocates who say when you, when you, when, when, when you speak negatively about Israel, well, we're not speaking negatively about Israel. We're showing where the scriptures, where God is speaking negatively about Israel. Yeah. That's not replacement theology. However, the accusers of, of replacement theology really are themselves the replacement theologians, which is removed. For example, Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is regarding Christ's sacrifice. Isaiah 63, how often do you see that quoted? Isaiah 63 is the church sacrificed in the ends of days. And Israel completely rejects to help them. They are only rescued from Zion above. This is what I wrote, not below. It is probably the least favored or visited by most, yet it explains the church. And I ask, where are the Jewish people in this amazing prophecy? And I quote, he held them through the deep. He's talking about a certain people here. He held them through the deep as a horse through the wilderness, and they fainted not. And as cattle through a plain, the spirit came down from the Lord and guided them. Thus you led your people to make yourself a glorious name. Turn from heaven and look from your holy habitation and your glory. Where is your zeal and your strength? Where is the abundance of your mercy and of your compassions? This is the prayer of these people to God. That you withheld yourself from us. For you are our father. For Abraham knew us not. These people never met Abraham. Mm -hmm. And Israel did not acknowledge us. Israel rejected us. Mm -hmm. Yet do thou, O Lord, our Father, deliver us. Your name has been upon us from the beginning. The Jews don't recognize us. And we were not part of Abraham in the ancient times. We're not part of the deliverance of Moses out of Egypt. Yes. We're new to this flock. Mm -hmm. We came later on. Mm -hmm. But the Jews, the Jewish people rejected us. Yes. Mm -hmm. So they were persecuted by everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's the part where Christ, even in Matthew 25, he divides the nations. For I was hungry, you gave me food. I was naked, you clothed me. He's referring to Isaiah 63. Mm -hmm. Paul in Romans 1 is referring to Ezekiel chapter 16. That's a whole, whole different study. Yes. Yeah. Let me ask you this, Wally. The way you're explaining all this, the way that I'm seeing it is now Christendom is falling into harlotry and heresy. So... As Christians, if we look at physical Israel back in the Old Testament, the examples that when Christendom falls into those same errors and heresy, you can expect judgment and correction, just like God always tried to bring through the prophets when the, before Christ came, of always trying to bring them back to him. And now Christendom's falling into the same type of errors, so he's trying to bring the Christendom back to repentance. Absolutely, it's a very good point. Yeah. That we, no, we, 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 we pick on the Jews. Mm -hmm. Oh, we forgot to look at ourselves. Yes. That's the wrong approach. Sin is very similar to the sins of, of Israel. Mm -hmm. 
But ancient Israel didn't have the sin of supporting Solomon. Yes. The Christendom did. But today, Israel Dom does the same too. They also support Solomon. Mm -hmm. And that's why he's saying, look, the whole Cain Kaburu, Jerusalem and her daughters. Yes. Born of her. So we have to understand the big picture here. He's addressing, when he addresses Jerusalem in scripture prophetically, he's addressing both Israel and the church because yes. we're born of Jerusalem. Yes. You see? And then that's why Paul, he talks about this in Galatians chapter 4. Mm -hmm. You know, there's two cities here. This is the bottom line, really. The bottom line is God hates one city and the daughters of those cities. Mm -hmm. And he uplifts the Jerusalem above. Yes. The holy Mount Zion above, yes. not Mount Zion below. Yes. And so the battle is really between two cities, the city of God and the city that the devil instituted. Yes. And so really, Mystery Babylon encompasses much it encompasses literally Jerusalem, Israel as well, born of her, Christendom. He's saying the whole King Kaburu. Mm -hmm. He's, it truly could be that he's sick of all the church services these days. Mm -hmm. He's tired of it all. Yeah. He wants righteousness. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, that's good. Yes. And um, I think that segues us great into um, closing today's teaching on Mystery Babylon Part 3. Ted, we want to thank you for bringing out the current events there in the beginning. And as always, everyone tuning in, keep a close eye watch as, as Waleed, Ted, and Andrew are bringing out um, relevant topics as well as we're going to be including the um, articles that Waleed wrote from Generation Sodom. Those are going to be attached in the description as well. So for further understanding and teaching, um, Waleed, you wrote these articles over a year ago. And so the, that's what you were referring to from today. So we'll have those uh, linked in the description. But we just want to thank everyone for, for tuning in for uh, part three. Um, we will bring a conclusion to part four next week, and then we'll introduce some new topics as well. But we pray you have a great day. Wally, Ted, as always, we thank you, and uh, we salute you for all your hard work, your study, and the uh, blessing you are to the body of Christ. Thank you. You bet. Thank you.